Hilda Broomfield Le Tempierre. Uh, and we also have Andrew Leach as part of the session. And uh, briefly, Hilda is currently the president and chief financial officer of Pressure Pipe Steel Fabrication Limited, an industrial and mining supplier that services some of the largest resource development projects in Labrador. Uh, Hilda and her husband, Lionel, began this company in the front yard of their first home in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Labrador. So, so what can start off as a mom and pop sort of uh, business can absolutely grow and flourish in the north. Uh, Hilda, as an Inuk woman, is a non -traditional in a non-traditional industry. Uh, continues to give back to the community through her encouragement and support for her female-owned businesses. So we're going to have Hilda come up very shortly, and uh, it's going to be a di slightly different format. It's not going to be a panel. Hilda's going to uh, share some, I think, of uh, her experience, which we all can benefit from. And then I'm going to, uh, afterwards, uh, bring up Andrew, and Andrew is a proud member of his uh, Satinetnik. Oh, say it again. Statlium. Ah, there we go. Nation. It's in the interior of BC and is currently the chair of the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in business administration. Andrew owns and operates a successful management consulting business and he specializes in First Nation leadership and management support. And as chair of NACCA, Andrew participates on national policy tables pertaining on Canadian Aboriginal businesses and economic development. So clearly, we have two very accomplished people that uh, are going to um, impart um, not only their experience, but I, I'm sure some um, wise insights as they um, have many years of experience. So I'm going to ask Hilda to come up. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Madeline. I'm Inuit and I'm here. <laughs> I, I have to take a minute to reflect on, on the presenters this morning. It was just awesome, fantastic, uh, great uh, um, fuel for, for what I feel and what I believe and what I go through. Uh, based on what Aluki had said about government should fully implement what we have already agreed to, Absolutely, that's one of the things that we share on our National Indigenous Economic Development Board. We need to do it now. Johannes talked about the investment of criti critical infrastructure and food security uh, and about the problems having with the, with the airstrip in, in Nain. Um, and that's some of the work that the board has actually just finished. We've completed our report on northern infrastructure. And uh, one of the things that we show is that people's core needs are not being met. So the money that's given out by the federal government is used to help people with just the core needs. How can it be used for infrastructure when people don't have uh, good, healthy water to drink with boil water orders in communities that's been for, there for years and overcrowding in homes and moldy homes and, and don't have the education level or the connectivity or the energy that, that we need for all of our communities across Canada, whether we're First Nations, Inuit, or Métis. And with Natan talking about uh, the economic re reconciliation legislation regulations, I have a really interesting story that I want to share with you based on what he talked about uh, with Americans coming in 1941 and how he went to Boston. My dad um, is a, was a, um, a guide, a snow, a snow, uh, um, a dog team guide. He actually took all of the uh, ministers and doctors to the coast of Labrador. They had their fuel caches in the summer where they stored all their fuel and their food for the winter. And, and he walked, like he walked from Riglet to Goose Bay. And uh, I can't believe he did that. When I first moved back to Labrador in 91, we had our snowmobiles and, and it took us 
you know, three or four hours, five hours to go to go there and skidoo. And I was complaining. I can imagine he walked what, what kind of resili resiliency that they had. And in 1941, when the base started, my dad came to Labrador, uh, went to Goose Bay and worked on the base. And my grandmother, uh, um, when uh, Natan talked about going to Boston to get his education, when my grandmother was a young girl, she froze her legs. And my great-grandfather was gone into the woods to get food and to get wood. And uh, he had been gone for several days. So she, so she was in a great, horrible state by the time he came back. When he came back, her legs were so bad from being frozen, he had to chop them off. He had to chop her legs off. That's the kind of uh, uh, things that we went through in, in the day. Um, so just to show how resilient people are, my grandmother went to Boston and uh, got her schooling in Boston. Uh, I remember her very well uh, going around the house with no legs and doing everything that had to be done. And she spoke five languages. And I, here I can't even speak a Nuktatuk yet. Uh, so just to show uh, how resilient people are and what they go through and, and how they survive the struggles of uh, living, especially in those days. And the senator talked about the transportation from the northern perspective. So, and, and, and I wanted to say he's not alone. We, we experience the same issues with, with First Nations and Métis, and that's a lot of the work that the board has done in the past. So um, all of our reports for the work that we've done are on our website for the National Indigenous and Economic Development Board. So I, I couldn't start without reflecting on, on, on those speakers this morning. They were just fantastic. So good morning, everyone. My name is Hilda Brunfield Templier. I'm a member of the National Indigenous Economic Development Board. For those who may not know, the NIEDB was established in 1990 as a governor and council appointed board mandated to provide strategic policy advice to the federal government on issues related to indigenous economic development. We are comprised of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit business and community leaders from across Canada. The board helps governments to respond to the unique needs and circumstances of indigenous peoples in Canada. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this conference, Expanding the Circle. What reconciliation and inclusive economic growth can mean for Inuit and Canada? This is the third time the board is holding a conference of this magnitude. As you may know, reconciliation and inclusive growth are major priorities for the federal government. Therefore, now is a great time to, a, to be able to engage with you on this topic. The board is thrilled to partner with National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association, the Public Policy Forum, and the Inuit Teparitic Kandatanami to bring you this event. This is the final in our three events we'll be doing together on the same theme. <clears throat> and I really re respected how um, um, uh, Luki talked about our uh, not seeing the coast to coast, the longest coast on there. So it gives us food for thought of how we should uh, make sure that we're all inclusive in the future. Today's focus is on Inuit. While we hosted a conference on reconciliation and inclusive growth for First Nations in February, and a second conference with a Métis focus in Winnipeg in November 2017. If you'd like to find out more about what, you, what was said during these conferences, the videos of these events are available on the Public Policy Forum's Facebook page. Our exciting lineup of speakers will talk about the importance of Indigenous economic development in the context of reconciliation and how inclusive growth can be a tremendous benefit to Canada. Seizing the $27.7 billion opportunity. Before we begin, before we begin I, would, I want to tell you about the report that served as the foundation for the Expanding the Circle conferences. The report Reconciliation, Growing Canada's Economy by $27.7 billion, showed that if all opportunities were equal, <clears throat> and the indigenous labor force was mobilized, it could lead to a $27.7 billion annual contribution to the Canadian GDP. Let me tell you how. <clears throat> Canada faces a looming demographic challenge as its population is aging. 
As boomers retire, the shrinking workforce will result in increased health care costs, higher taxes on fewer, or on fewer working people, and loss of productivity. In order to maintain our standard of living, Canada must focus on increasing labor productivity, and it must recognize that immigration alone cannot make up the shortfall. To maintain levels of productivity, Canada must invest heavily in human capital to ensure an adequate future supply of skilled labour. That begs the question, where can we find plenty of homegrown human capital? Well, in contrast to the general population, the Indigenous population is young and growing fast. In 2011, 46% of the Indigenous population was under the age of 25. This represents a wealth of labor potential, potential that is currently underused. We have been saying this for nearly two decades. But investing in our youth needs to be more focused through a real concerted effort. But to capitalize on the waiting indigenous labor force, we need to close the gap in income and prosperity that exists between indigenous and non-indigenous Canadians. There are so many barriers to Indigenous economic participation, including shortage of jobs, lack of education and equitable funding for education, lack of training, work inexperience, remoteness, lack of transportation, lack of digital infrastructure, not knowing where or how to look for work, shortage of employer willingness to hire Indigenous youth employees. We can begin to address these barriers by improving education and training at the K-12 level, the post-secondary level, and by creating Indigenous job training programs. We can also address these barriers by ensuring that, indig in that Indigenous peoples have the same access to economic opportunities as other Canadians, including access to new jobs, equal conditions of employment, and access to capital so that Indigenous peoples can start their own businesses. Finally, we can make real progress to closing these gaps by, by solving the problems of clean drinking water, access to health and mental health care, proper housing and community infrastructure, internet connectivity and remote communities. Our report revealed that closing these gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous productivity would not only lead to a $27.7 billion increase in GDP annually, but it would also lift over 100,000 people out of poverty and save Canadians 2.2 billion annually in poverty costs. Advancing the social, social economic well-being of Canada's Indigenous peoples, reducing poverty, and getting people participating in the economy is why we're all here today. And why I'm so pleased that so many of you have come to engage in the discussion with us. We are very happy to have participate participants joining us from across the Inuit Nunagat and on behalf of our board of, of our board members, many of whom are present here today, the National Indigenous Economic Development Board would like to welcome you. I won't say more now, but I will invite my co-host, Andrew Leach, Chief Executive Officer of the National Aboriginal Capital Corporation Association, to offer you his welcome as well. Thank you. Nukamik. Thanks, Hilda. Actually, I'm not the chair of NACA. The chair is right there, Shannon Matadwaban, and he's kind of worried right now if he's got a job after this. So don't worry, Shannon. It's all good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm from the uh, uh, community or from the nation Shtatlium. Can you say that, Shtatlium? Oh, I, just, I know my people back home like that when they say that. So uh, maybe a bit of background about myself first, and then I'll get into uh, the quick 10-minute spiel about uh, what it is that we do and how it might be related to uh, why we're all gathering today. Uh, there's about 6,000 Shtatlium in the interior of BC, and there's about 10 communities. And it's all high in the mountains along the Fraser River, and we're fishermen. So if you come into my area in the middle of the summer, you'll be seeing people like me standing outside uh, on the banks of the Fraser River, the long pole with a net uh, hooped at the end, scooping out salmon, lots of salmon, 
hundreds of salmon. You can catch hundreds of salmon a day if you want when you're up there in the summer. If you guys ever want to come out that way and check it out, uh, you can get my contact. I'd love to see you see that. I was very intrigued with the seal hunting this morning, and it made me equate to that thought of what we do. And we still do this to this day. If you go down to the Fraser River up in, in the Lillewood area, you'll see all these racks lined up along the, the river and their um, family racks and family um, held areas where you go down there and you just basically are with your family doing this gathering. And it's been intriguing watching just in my own lifetime how things have changed where you've lived this way, you grew up this way, it was your way of life and all of a sudden now there's this money economy that's here that we've got to work with, right? And so I heard that this morning when I was listening to uh, the speakers and quite very impressed with the speakers, by the way. And so it made me think a lot about the transitioning that we go through and what we, what we need to do about that. So uh, I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of idea about that um, uh, uh, this morning that I got. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Elder Sally this morning uh, for her words and uh, she really made me think a lot about her question when she talked about the need for financing uh, in, in her question and I'll certainly make comment on that in a, in a few minutes. And as well, um, the organizers. Uh, uh, public policy forum. Uh, God, you guys are a good bunch, by the way. We've been uh, doing some work with them, NACA, for uh, over a year now on these forums. I just love these forums. To sit and to think and to process with a bunch of people who are in the same arena as you or in the ballpark of that arena and just to start processing how do we solve this problem? What is the problem? That's just great. And, and they do this kind of work. And they've been excellent at organizing these things. And uh, the people that I've uh, had the uh, pleasure and honor to interface with there are a very smart, organized bunch. And I'd just like to um, acknowledge them. And as well, the um, National Indigenous. What did it change from Aboriginal to Indigenous? Is that what happened? OK. So the National Indigenous Economic Development Board. My, what a mouthful that is, by the way. I like ours, NACA. You can just say NACA. Okay, so uh, this, this group here, uh, they're a national body too. They're committed to economic development. Uh, our board, uh, our group met with theirs uh, a year or so ago and see that we have a lot in common. And we're all trying to work towards a, a similar cause. And uh, uh, hats off to them. They, they've co-hosted these events with us um, in the past and have been a good working partner with us. Okay, a little bit about NACA now. So somebody made comment about the, uh, the um, posters that we've got up here. These are our posters, NACA. NACA, the National Aboriginal Capital Corporation Association. We've been around for a few decades and we have uh, uh, 55 plus uh, members across Canada. And I'd like to apologize for the, com for the words from coast to coast to those who um, took that and said, what about us? I, I take those words very seriously, by the way, and I will commit to you that we're going to change all of our stuff to say from coast to coast to coast, okay? And it does speak to the um, um, issues that, that come up. I mean, we have members of our organization who are part of uh, your groups. And I'd like to uh, mention them and acknowledge them now. And uh, we have uh, Katikmiat Community Futures, uh, uh, Kavalik Business Development Center, uh, the Nunavik Investment Corporation, and also the uh, Baffin Business Development Corporation. And Val, the GM, is here with us today. Hi, Val. And, uh, of the uh, 55 plus of us, we've got these four, and you can see the little dots on the map there of where uh, our, our members are, and you can kind of deduce which ones would belong to your groups. And uh, we uh, basically, our business is to get capital, money, out to entrepreneurs, to business people, okay? That's what we do. And that's my passion, by the way. I, you take a look at this issue of reconciliation and you say, what does it mean? What does, what does it, uh, how, how does it, can it be impacted for us? And for NACA, it's about getting money into the hands of the entrepreneurs. That's what it's about. Because we know this. 
capital makes the world go around. For all the blah, blah, blahs, getting money into people's pockets so that they can get a business off the ground and sustained and growing is the best thing that we can do. That's my bias, by the way. So how do we get money out to the entrepreneurs? And how do we get it to be sustainable? Those are the issues that we've dealt with for decades and have worked with our 55 plus partners across Canada to uh, try to make this work. One thing we know for sure, that if capital is really important, access to capital is not a level playing field. And I heard that this morning. Uh, you hear it, if you uh, think about it, that the North and its isolated places don't have the same access to capital that others uh, have the luxury of having, right? I was just in the community not too long ago, by the way. It was a sad story where um, this community, very isolated, didn't have access to a bank and um, had to go hours and hours just to get to do banking business. And some guy ran into a bit of money, had to cash his check at the local store, $9,000, and people knew he had $9,000, and somebody um, killed him and took his money. And it made me think, you know, just not having access to a bank, these kind of things that would happen like that, right? Just take that for granted, some of the parts of the world. In some places, it's just not that way. So access to capital is not a, playing, a level playing field. And what we are trying to do is to level that playing field. And we know indigenous groups around the world have had non-level playing field in access to capital. You take a look at the history of any indigenous group, I, I argue, that they've had laws, they've had policies, they've had geography, they've had a whole bunch of things stacked up against them so that they didn't have the level playing field on access to capital. And again, we know this. If you've got capital, you can get a business off the ground and grow. If you don't, it just makes things really, really tough. So our business, our passion, is to try to get that capital out there. And we've been doing quite well at it, by the way. The government, uh, a few decades back, put out about $200 uh, billion, uh, 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 sorry, million dollars of uh, money to uh, these groups called Aboriginal Financial Institutions. Those are our 55 plus, named for our 55 plus members, by the way. And so they took that money and they put it out into their communities. And the money got given back to them through loans. And we took that money and we put it back out into the community again. And we revolved that money to now where it's over $2 billion that we've put out of an initial investment of $200 million. And we argue this. Any government program will go up against them. Any program, not just Aboriginal. Show me where you can take $200 million and turn it into $2 billion. And this is what I think is the beauty about what we could do here, is let's start getting capital into um, on, uh, Inuit entrepreneurs' hands, get them to start growing businesses, investing, and we can see the impact on it. You'll see some of the stats here. When we take one dollar and we put it into one of your entrepreneurs' hands, they'll create $3.60 in GDP. That's a good investment any way you cut it, okay? So this is the things that we're talking about wanting to do. And uh, we know this too as well that we need to provide capacity to support to some, that money uh, is great, but in some cases, capacity support is equally important. Uh, just a quick side story, I wanted to, to, I have a bit of a housing background from my other day in, in, in life too. And I, we, we're, we were studying what happened when the government started getting into home ownership. And they took a lot of these uh, rural homes and basically gave them to, um, um, indigenous people who were moving out of an isolated place into a more uh, central place. And they said, all you have to do is pay the mortgage and the house is yours after 20 years. And they found a lot of those people bailed on their homes after a couple of years. Didn't want to upkeep it, didn't want to do this, didn't want to do that, pay their taxes. And a lot of people, these homes, by the way, are now worth, back in BC, some of them are worth over a million dollars. Somebody had it 20 years ago for six months and said, I don't want it anymore, you can have it back. And I go, oh my God, what's up with that? Can you imagine 
having a home and just sitting on rather than paying rent and paying your mortgage and then okay you have to pay a tax every year and you have to fix this and that every once in a while you'd have over a million dollars in your pocket but people bailed on it 20 years ago and i i believe it was because they didn't have the capacity support to go with the the capital the asset and so that's what we know too here that uh, providing the capital and the support are very important to get the business off the ground and going. So where are we? Well, we're banging on the government's door saying, you took $200 million and you put it into uh, Indigenous hands and look what we've done. We've done a great, great job. Do more of this now. They've cut that dry for years. And we're saying our population is young. It's growing. It's, you see our economies. We're now in the place to be active members and participants in our economy. We need capital. Get that injection over to us. And quite honestly, where's my government guy? There he is. You're the, you're the guy I want to talk to. We, they've been slow to responding to getting that money uh, that, that we've been asking. We've been asking for uh, you know, $100 million. And really, when you think around across the country, that's not a lot of money. And we know what we can do with that money. We will roll it over and roll it over, and it'll be a good investment. And we think that's what we need to do. So in thinking about some of the things that I heard this morning, I'd say, yeah, let's, let's work together to make that happen. Let's get some money into your um, entrepreneur's hands, and let's provide some capacity support so that uh, they can be successful in the businesses that they're wanting to embark upon. And if we can do those kind of things, I think we, we've got something that we can work with together. I guess one final thought I had um, was when I heard the thought of an Inuit college, my ears perked up. I go, oh, that sounds cool. I like that idea. You know, we talk about PPF and these kind of meetings that we get together and just this learning that comes from, from these kind of engagements. I'd love to see the thought of how you'd go about doing that. And uh, I've seen some pretty innovative, creative models on um, uh, you know, advanced education uh, building uh, in isolated, remote Indigenous communities. It makes me wonder about that, too, because I'd love to see uh, people coming together in some place and starting to do that and getting some of these ideas um, developed further, because that's a critical part of uh, our overall capacity building, is having ins our own institutions that we can um, uh, learn from and, and share the knowledge that we have as well. Okay, so there's my spiel with you. I think that's about my 10 minutes. I guess the only other thing that I'd like to say is my uh, uh, two plugs I've got. One, NACA has um, got a box suite for tonight's Saint, uh, Ottawa Senators game. And we're giving away some tickets through a raffle if you're here tonight. And so put your business card in the um, up front at uh, our NACA place. And uh, who knows, maybe you get to go check out the game tonight. Second thing, you guys are saying you should have started with that, Andrew. <laughs> is uh, as I as I've alluded, uh, capital is a very important thing for NACA, and uh, we're hosting the first annual uh, conference on access to capital in uh, Gatineau um, uh, in February, February 27th, 28th, 29th. We're hoping that you can uh, uh, look into this some more and hopefully uh, get down or let people know about it because we'd like to start talking and sharing uh, amongst us uh, about the importance of capital and what we can do to get more of it out to our entrepreneurs. Thank you very much.